thing. Today's is a multimodality diagnostic approach to Takwasubo cardiomyopathy. Uh, it's uh, going to be given by the Dr. Vinay Kumar Sarma, Additional Director of Cardiology, Fortis Escorts Heart Institute and Research Center, New Delhi, to case-based multimodality diagnostic approach in Takwasubo cardiomyopathy. Regarding the topic, uh, Dr. Ramesh will uh, say a few words before the talk. Uh, thank you, sir, and good evening to all. And uh, we're going to have a wonderful session on uh, Taka Subhakaria Bhavati by two eminent speakers. This is going to be on uh, imaging, right? Since the, Ever since the description of uh, Taka Subhakaria in 1990, the various uh, diagnostic criteria and modalities have changed. So are the uh, treatment, I mean, uh, uh, diagnostic imaging modalities, starting from echo to uh, coronary CT imaging, spec, PET, and so on, right? Since it's going to be IA meeting, we'll focus on uh, echo, various, various forms like uh, uh, myocardial contrast echo and so on. So I over to the speaker, Dr. Vinay Kumar, on multimodalic diagnostic approach to Vitaka Subhakadiomyopathy. Over to you, sir. I think you are, mute, you are on mute, sir. You should unmute yourself, sir. You are on mute. Dr. Vinay Sharma is on mute. Uh, thank you. Yes, you are not. Evening, evening to all the friends, seniors, and colleagues who are watching this webinar. I'll be discussing a condition which all of us must have seen many times, and most of us will agree that it is so very easy to miss this condition until and unless our mind is primed to pick it up and we are actually suspecting it. So, Not more. Yeah. Give me one second. There is some issues coming up. It is just not okay. Yeah, now moving, sir. Now moving. Uh, now moving. Yeah. Sorry. So Takatsubo syndrome in has been defined as an acute and transient heart failure syndrome. You know, if you take the LV angiograms of this patient, then the end systolic frames, they resemble a contraption which has been used to catch octopuses in, in, in Japan. And since the initial reports came from Japan, so the name is Tak Takatsubo cardiomyopathy. But a better name probably would have been Stas induced cardio cardiomyopathy because it gives you at least some idea that what is precipitating this, this condition or an apical ballooning syndrome, which gives you at least some idea that, that how the heart appears in various imaging modalities. Now, what precipitated this condition, the prognosis, molecular mechanism, treatment, all that will be discussed by, uh, by my friend who will be talking next. And what I will be doing, I'll be confining myself of uh, uh, dealing with a multimodality diagnostic approach in order not to miss the diagnosis. So let us discuss this in context with the real life scenario. So this case, she was a 71-year-old uh, lady of European descent and she was admitted in a, near, in a near, nearby hospital for dental implant. There was nothing significant in the history she was not a known patient of coronary disease. She was non-diabetic. She was normotensive. And she had left a smoke 16 years ago. As a part of the pre-op workup, only ECG was done, which was found to be normal. She was taken up to the OT. She was given a short GA. And soon thereafter, she developed profound hemo hemodynamic inst instability. A 12-lead ECG was done, which revealed significant changes. And patient was referred to, the, I mean, referred to us because, very, because we were very near to that hospital. So when the patient came, an echo was done. And, you know, if you look at the echo, the superficially it resembles regional ball motions of an MI, although it also holds the biggest clue, which I will be discussing later on. Unfortunately, no pre-op echo was done. So there was no way to know whether changes were acute or they were pre-existing. However, the raised drop I suggested an acute chronic syndrome. So naturally, the patient was taken because she was unstable, having she was taken up to the cath lab. And these were the angio images. I am showing four representative angio images. And as you can see, there was nothing in the coronary which could have suggested that this patient has suffered an acute coronary syndrome. Patient was married conservatively. One week later, the ECG changes started resolving. But what was more revealing was that the echo. An echo which was hardly 30-35% just one week ago now has become completely normal. This was just for the comparison. 
this was the ego taken at the time of admission and this was the taker this was the ego taken one week later and you can see that the that the lv function has completely improved over a period of just one week now if you want now if i want to summarize this patient summarize whatever has happened in this patient we can do in one line and that is this patient has suffered a transient lv dysfunction which was non ischemic now if you remember the first line which i said at the very beginning of this talk that takatsuo has been defined as a transient uh, heart heart failure syndrome so the question naturally that comes is that that is it that can it be called takatsuo syndrome prima facie yes prima facie yes but eco findings are only a beginning it has to be subjected and it has to withstand some kind of a diagnostic criteria before we can say that the patient has a takatsuo uh, syndrome so there are so many of these diagnostic criteria which are there in, which are there this is one heart failure association europe and society of Cardi cardiology criteria there is inter international takatsubo diagnostic criteria or inter ta ke diagnostic criteria there is a revised mayo clinic criteria now if you look at this slide it looks so confusing so cluttered and so and you know so uh, so confusing but if you read it carefully you will realize that they are all relying on certain key words one of them it is transient second is that that it is extending beyond the territory of a single coronary artery there is an absence of coronary, uh, coronary artery disease which can explain the pattern of rwma then it is reversible and it recovers on its own after some time these are the key words and various permutation and combinations they form this criteria now let us talk about the one which is most commonly used and that is inter ta ke diagnostic criteria for takatsubo which has got very high sensitivity and specificities is specificity for differentiating takatsubo from the acute coronary syndromes now let us talk about it in detail if we read this criteria you know the things that have been mentioned or there which are i mean which are required at part of this criteria they can be divided into four parts one is that it is transient lv dysfunction and this lv dysfunction extend beyond the single single coronary vascular vascular territory rv involvement may or may not be present and it presented as an apical ballooning or mid mid uh, mid ventricular basal or focal valve motion abnormalities the second part of the information in this criteria is that that there is an emotional physical or a combined trigger which precedes but it is not obligatory the neurological disease or pheo may serve as a trigger the new ecg uh, abnormalities are usually present and only rarely it happens that the patient of takatsubo uh, takatsubo are having a normal ecg the cardiac biomarkers are raised but not to the extremes the important word is that they are moderately raised and post menopausal women they are predominantly affected the third set of information is that that significant coronary disease is not a contraindication but if cat is present it should not be sufficient to explain the observed wall wall motion abnormalities and lastly the patient should have no evidence of myocarditis these are the four sets of information which are required if you want to subject the patient to inter ta ke diagnostic criteria now if you want to evolve some kind of an approach based on this criteria then you realize that this is step 1 these are the clinical things which we look for in the patient and then as step 2 we go for an echo then as step 3 we go for coronary disease you have to document coronary disease is there or not and then at step 4 we need an mri to document whether this patient has got a infect infect my uh, this uh, infection or not so accordingly now we will go we will walk through these steps one by one so let us come to the first one that is the clinical so if you look at the clinically acute chest pain ecg abnormalities increased biomarkers generally occurs in post menopausal women and only 10% are male patient and usually there is a history of stressor event and if we look at our patient our patient has all of them so clinically it fits into the clinical presentation fits into the takatsubo but this is only the beginning now we go to the step 2 in the step 2 usually it will automatically with their transthoracic echo now if you look at the echo there will be primarily basically there will be two uh, two forms of uh, pattern which are seen in the takatsubo one is known as the apical ballooning form where the apex and the mid segment are akinetic while the basal segments are not only normal but sometimes but majority of time they are actually hyper hyperkinetic in an mi you you expect the uh, adjacent part to be stunned but in takatsubo the basal segments are actually moving more than the normal 
and the second form is known as the mid mid ventricular form where the echinacea is confined to the mid segment and apical segments are normal or only mild, mildly hypoplate and mid and apical are achinatic. The first two variants, one and two, the apical ballooning and mid ventricular form, they account for the vast majority of Takatsuga. The signature mark is the wall motion involving apical and mid segment in all the views, suggesting a circumferential pattern of the myocardial. Uh, suggesting a circumferential pattern of the myocardial dysfunction beyond the territory of a single coronary disease. This circumferential pattern is the hallmark of TTS diagnosis and should always be described in the, eco, in the ECO report. And as you will see, we will be coming again and again and again and back to this, uh, this description that there is a circumferential pattern of myocardial involvement. In addition, there can be a dynamic LV outflow tactile obstruction because the basal segments are moving more than the normal. And especially if the LV cavity is small, then they can have a LV OTO. And it may be worsened by inotropes or diuretics, which might be given to the patient for failure. There can be moderate MR, and there can be a biventricular ballooning, which reinforces the diagnosis of TDS. There is achinesis or dyskinesis of apical and mid RV segment, just like of the LV. And if you remember, it is just the opposite of what the apical is pairing, which is seen in the pulmonary thrombo thromboembolism or the reverse McPullen sign. It is very useful when we are trying, when we are trying to differentiate the different causes of breathlessness in a patient who is sick. Uh, this pattern suggests that this patient has probably has got a Takat sugar. So now it is time to go back to the case one. If you remember, I told you that it superficially resembles, looks like the involvement of LED. The closer inspection proved that the basal segments are moving normally in all the views, suggesting a circumferential pattern rather than involve, uh, involving a particular coronary this presents, this, this, this is very, very, I mean, uh, sort of a signature mark pattern of wall, wall motion in Takatsubo. This pattern of regional wall motion is uniform and defining feature of Takatsubo and the principal modality to differential diagnose Takatsubo from acute MI and acute myocarditis. Because in, in Takatsubo, the wall motion do not confine to any coronary territory. Entire circumference of apical or mid plane of LV is involved the wall motion affects the mid and apical plane in all the views, and the basal plane of the view is hyper hyperkinetic. In MI, there is always a vascular distribution, and in acute myocarditis, there is a global involvement. You will not find the basal segment moving more than the usual, so the acute myocarditis will have a global dysfunction. And this is another case. And if you look at it, all the three views, the apical 3C, 4C, and 2C, the basal segments are moving, and the mid and the apical segments, they are, they are akinetic or hypokinetic. Now, uh, skeptics can say that the pattern of regional motion, wall motion is soft sign which can be easily missed. The answer is, but it is only a sign. This is the only, this is the only, only sign. Your eyes will see what your mind knows. Still, the question remains that there should be some way of objectively documenting the pattern, the signature pattern of the wall, wall, uh, wall motion abnormalities of Takatsuba. Rather than subjective eyeballing, there should be some objective way of documenting it. And strain net imaging provides a perfect way to objectively document the pattern of RWM. Look at it. This is from the first case. And if you look at it, the, the curve, the strain curve from the mid and the apical segment, they are going above the baseline. That means they are dyskinetic or they are, belling, uh, they are ballooned out. And now look at the, base, the strain curve from the basal segment, they are still normal. So that suggests that this patient has got a mid and apical. This objectively documents that the mid and the apical segment are, are dyskinetic, while the basal segments are moving normally or they're hyper, they're hyper, uh, hyperkinetic. So this is very objective. There is no scope for a subjective variation in assessing the wall, wall motions in this patient. And now when you repeat this, when you do the strain imaging on the 4C and the 2C also, the same pattern is repeated. That means that the ballooning across all the three standard, standard views while the basal segments are moving normally. So this very objectively document without leaving any scope for uh, subjective variation between the different observers about the pattern of wall, wall motion in Takatsuba. So strain net imaging is extremely useful in objectively documenting the pattern of wall, wall motions. If, if, you, if you look at the bullseye map, you can always, I mean, you can appreciate that the apical segment, they are blue, they are dyskinetic. And, the, and there is a gradient of motion from the apex towards the base. 
Now, distinctive pattern of RWMA can also be appreciated by three-dimensional echo or contrast echo. This was case number three. This patient had a, this was a very interesting patient. This patient has a, done a stenting done one month earlier. There was a lot of familial stress, but nothing dramatic to proceed to Takatsubo. She was a lady, postmenopausal, all those things were there. But there was no stress, I mean, obvious stress, which could have precipitated. She presented with breathlessness, and she was taken to the cath lab, and the stents were found to be patent. Till now, it was absolutely fine. But things change when I saw the report and realized that the echo done one month ago was absolutely normal. And that is the time when we start looking from the from the I mean from the point of view of picking up Takatsubo, and you can see in the 2D that the basal segment and all three views are moving, but the mid and the apical segment they are not moving. So this is this was a strain imaging. It is from a different uh, machine from a different vendor, but again it is showing a base to apex gradient. But what I want to show you is this. We did a three-dimensional imaging, and you can very easily appreciate that the basal segments are moving very, very briskly, while the mid and apical segment are not moving that briskly. So in complicated situations, three-dimensional echo of creating an LV cast, it can really help in appreciating the pattern of wall motion abnormalities. However, now we come to the step three of the diagnostic approach. Diagnosis is often first suspected after a coronary angio which is to be done in all the acute coronary syndrome patients with STD changes and reveal, and in these patients, it reveals the normal coronaries. Now, according to European or American guidelines, consensus guidelines about the definition of MI, TTS has been defined as a myocardial injury and categorized as menoka. So the diagnosis of TTS should always be based on absence of CAT or if present, which happens in about 15% patient, it should not be sufficient to explain the observed pattern of wall motion abnormalities. And it should be emphasized that obstructive single vessel disease is not an ex absolute exclusion criteria since wall motion ab abnormalities usually extend beyond a single coronary artery territory in the Takatsu. Now, this, uh, the images which I have shown you till now, they are from my, uh, my, from my own archives. The images I will show beyond this they will always, they, they, are, they are also from my own collection. But as far as LV NGO is concerned, because after all, the whole business of naming is Takat Subo is starting with LV, LV NGO. But usually the presentation of the patient is like that, that you cannot persuade a cardiologist to perform an LV NGO in this patient. So I have to borrow these images from the European, from the Oxford University Press, Press and European Association Cardiology Imaging. And it shows the same pattern. Now, 30% patients of Takat Subo with apical balloon uh, pattern will have an apical nipple sign, which in very small zone with preserved contactility is a sign which is seen in the Takat Subo. And some of them can have a hawk beak sign where the apex is not that apex has got some contraction, so it creates the impression of a hawk beak. I've never seen them. We don't do LV angio. So now. Once we now, by now, we are almost sure that this patient, that this patient is Takat Subo. But one thing still remains that you want to ex, uh, extrude myocarditis. Now, if you look at this, again, the same thing. The wall motion in Takat Subo do not confine to any coronary tree. In acute MI, they have got a vascular distribution. In acute myocarditis, they are global. Now, these, these, the first, uh, these two images which you are seeing are from the first case. And you can very easily see that the basal segments are moving. The basal segments are moving and the mid and apical segments are not moving. Now, compare this 4C image with, their, with that from an AMI patient. And you can see the difference. The basal segment in the Takat Subo are moving in both septum and lateral wall. While if you look in the AMI patients, you know they have got a definite renal wall motion, which is confining to an LAD territory. But this is only the Cine image. What is the most important point that differentiate uh, Takat Subo from myocarditis are the T2 weighted images. The key finding comes from T2 weighted images, and there is a ventricular edema that appears as high signal intensity on T2 weighted images with a diffuse or transmural uh, dis distribution. So, T2 weighted black blood imaging allows to recognize edema 
because it suppresses both fat and the flowing blood signal and the ratio of main signal intensity of myocardium compared with that of the skeletal muscles of more than 1.9 is generally accepted to define edema. This is basically to define the edema. But you know, it is a visual impression. You look at it and you find that the myocardium is bright and not confining to any vascular distribution. That becomes a very, very important point to differentiate uh, Takatsubo from acute MI or myocarditis. Lastly, if, so you can see, I mean, we have taken a short axis view in a target super patient, and in all the three labels, you find that the bright net is extending to the whole circumference except at the base. So this kind of pattern, it suggests that this patient has got an edema or inflammation, which is confined to the mid and the apical segment, and not that much in the basal segment. Similarly, if we go for contrast enhanced sequences, then the absence of gadolinium enhancement using LG signal intensity threshold of 5ST is considered as diagnostic. You can see from the case one, these, these are the images from case one, and there is absolutely no enhancement of, I mean, in any, in any view. If you compare it with an MI, you will find that this enhancement, which is confined to the vascular territory. This again, one of our patients, I have taken this image just showed so that I can show you in comparison. In acute myocarditis, late enhancement is usually seen, but occurs in mid or sub-epicardial uh, sub, sub regions. Here, there is experimental methods which can work like strain net imaging, but since we have got a strain and speckle tracking has made the strain imaging so easy, it has brought it to day-to-day -day life. So there is really no need for this ex, uh, for these methods of calculating strain on the MRI, just for academic and theoretical interest, practically no use. Now, lastly, before I finish up my talk, is that two things. One is the role of CT. Practically, there is no role of CT. Because as far as the, I mean, documenting the cornea it is concerned, CT is superseded by an invasive angio. There is, you know, invasive angio is always done in this patient because their presentation is like that. And for other information, CT is super, uh, super, superseded by CMR because CT cannot give you tissue characterization. And the second thing is that, do we have any diagnostic protocol? To me, there is no diagnostic protocol. Once the patient comes to you, you know the sequence of events like that, that they will invariably force the operator along a certain line. They are coming with chest pain, they are unstable, there are ECG changes, there are changes on the echo. Naturally, they force the people to go for an NGO. Once the NGO comes out to be normal, then we go back. We look at it again, uh, and we found that it is Takatsubo over a period of time. You know, this patient recovers, that further proves that this patient is stuck at Subo. There is really no protocol. This, the sequence of event will take it. The importance, the way, the, I mean, the way to pick the condition is that, that you should be able to appreciate the typical pattern of wall, wall motion on the echo. If you can do that, you will pick it up. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. It's a nice uh, didactic lecture by Dr. Vinay Kumar Sarma. The second part of the lecture regarding the case-based discussion in uh, multimodality diagnostic approach to Takotsubo cardiomyopathy by Dr. Rohit Tandon, consultant physician, Department of Cardiology, Hero DMC Heart Institute. Uh, thank uh, you, sir, for the introduction. You, thank you for the introduction, Dr. Viramani. Uh, I would like Dr. Vinay Sharma to stop his screen sharing so I can start my presentation. Okay, just give me a second. Screen sharing. Screen sharing. Okay. Stop sharing. Yes. Can you see it now, sir? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, it is uh, going to uh, be uh, streaming live in uh, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Yeah, we are live. Okay, sir. So, good evening. Uh, uh, good evening, sir. Uh, good evening. It's a uh, IAU webinar on uh, January, 20, uh, January 17th regarding the... So, going to uh, be... Uh, streaming live and uh, yeah, that's the thing. Five, four, three, two, one. Yeah, yeah. Good evening. Uh, good evening, sir. You may continue. 
ये वेबिनार ऑन जनवरी 27 17 प्रोग्नोस्टिक पार्ट As sir has just described these uh, uh, two important criteria, Mayo and Intertag criteria, which has been used. I am not going into much details about this. The only important detail which I want to mention is that there is a beautiful cutoff which came from that Poland study of Intertag diagnostic score, which has a specificity of 95 percent. And out of that, the important part was a female postmenopausal with emotional trigger. Mostly, this is the commonest presentation. That is why they have been given the highest points in the Intertag score. and there are some easily changes which you may be mentioned but they have I, not been uh, readily found uh, dear sir can introduce a speaker sir yes sir can i can i introduce a speaker yes sir yes please yes please sir the uh, we are going to uh, have a nice discussion regarding the case based discussion of uh, in cardiac imaging today is a multimodality diagnostic approach to takosubo cardiomyopathy Uh, it's uh, going to be given by the dr vinay kumar sharma additional director cardiology fourth sesters heart institute and research center new delhi to case based metabolic diagnostic approach in takosubo cardiomyopathy regarding the topic uh, uh, ramesh will uh, say few words before the talk uh, thank you sir and good evening to all and i'm uh, going to have a wonderful session on uh, Taka Subo Kadiya Bhavati by two. I think someone going to be on a uh, image. I think the device is on. There is some problem. Subo Kadiya Bhavati nineteen ninety. The various uh, diagnostic criteria and modalities have changed. So are the uh, no, 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 no. Uh, diagnostic imaging modalities starting from echo to again, again. CT imaging, PET, PET, and so on. Right. Definitely. Uh, <laughs> these, these are. these were the part of the clinical yeah. modalities which are being used right. but once dr vinay kumar on multimodalic diagnostic mm -hmm. approach to theta ka subha cardiomyopathy over to you sir thank you sir so now when we are understanding the molecular mechanisms <coughs> we see that you uh, on mute sir you should unmute yourself sir you are on mute dr vinay sharma is on mute going some other uh, recorded is playing yeah so uh, thank you Yeah. Rohit, please ignore all the other comments. You please go on. Okay, sir. So the <clears throat> this uh, molecular mechanism started with the pathophysiology in the hypothalamus pituitary axis, and that the locus ceruleus. Our mind is trying to pick it up, and we are actually suspecting it. The locus ceruleus part that starts the initial trigger, and this trigger goes down to the adrenal axis. and from the adrenal axis it goes to the myocardium and causes acute myocardial dysfunction as we will understand these slides there will be further in involvement of the intra myocardial axis of catecholamine axis so <clears throat> the catecholamine release which is there it is a physical and emotional stress which produces the catecholamine release and then of course the patient is having intrinsic susceptibility to multivessel epicardial spasm there can be myocardial dysfunction there can and then leads to myocardial stunning and minor injury also which leads to the elevation of cardiac enzymes so overall there is this theory holds very good that there is a hypersympathetic nervous system activation producing microvascular spasm and in some patients lvot obstruction which is seen only 20% of the cases well it is very important for the diagnostic uh, part as well as the management part sir i am not able to uh, go to the slide next slide okay so this was a large study which uh, showed the uh, cases of uh, takasubo cardiomyopathy there were 1750 cases out of that 36% percent had physical triggers 28% emotional triggers and 7 to 8% had both triggers while no evidence was there in many so the emotional triggers were mainly grief loss panic anxiety or sometimes financial loss or anger and frustration 
but the physical triggers were very commonly seen in icu setting for example acute respiratory failure in 20% post surgical fracture fracture mobilization and cns conditions like subarachnoid hemorrhage infections and others so an anatomical variant sir had already described a pical ballooning is seen in typical 75 to 80% of the cases which may be associated with lvot obstruction and further on a pical thrombus formation these have variable prognosis the mid ventricular variety is 10 to 20% having severe lv systolic dysfunction and in this acute heart failure is the commonest presentation basal or inverted one has less severe hemodynamic compromise from the treatment point of view while biventricular has severe hemodynamic compromise and cardiogenic shock mostly these are the patient which are less than 0.5% which may require the institution of iabp <coughs> support <coughs> the novel pathophysiological hypothesis which these authors had described was the beta adrenergic receptor signaling pathway in ventricular cardiomyocyte the beta 2 ar theory the beta 2 ar theory basically is saying that as the pituitary hypothalamus locus ceruleus secretes the catecholamine thing and then adrenal axis and this affects the beta 2 ar receptor and then enhances the further myocardial stunning now <coughs> Why there is, uh, this is a normal patient in which uh, their coronary artery is open, they have seen the intraventricular pressure. Intraventricular pressure is same as the almost the aortic pressure. While in Takasubo, there is catecholamines here in the whole myocardium. They cause the coronary artery spasm, myocardial stunning and the intramyocardial pressure increases and leads to dilatation of the LV cavity. Why there is typical anatomical variant? Why not other variants? This may be due to predisposition of the beta receptor density over the apical area. As we can see, the negatively inotropic antiopotic areas are in the apex and in the mammalian hearts. So, increased apical sensitivity to catecholamines in the mammalian heart is responsible for this apical ballooning syndrome. While there were other theories that adrenal induced the vasospasm is there, which may be also one there. And there is one important thing which uh, some uh, these pathophysiological studies have shown that there is a molecular switch mechanism, that there is a switch from GS to G1 pathway, and that's a basically a protective mechanism to acute myocardial stunning. So these uh, studies have helped us to understand the main molecular mechanisms so that we can decide upon the treatment of these acute condition. And uh, what happens to the vessels, the coronary microvasculation versus the epicardial coronary arteries, they behave differently. Epicardial coronary arteries may be age dependent, the atherosclerosis may be there, and then demand ischemia, acute coronary obstruction may be there. In vasospastic phenomena can be there in the epicardial coronary arteries. While in the microvascular dysfunction, there is impaired coronary physiology, decreased coronary myocardial blood flow, which is induced and causes Takasubu. There are some few theories in new papers which have come that nitrostative stress may be increased or there will be abnormal myocardial mechanism like fat droplet accumulation. But overall, the catecholamine surge theory is holding the maximum points. <coughs> uh, in various uh, these uh, my, uh, MRA brain studies, they have actually pointed out to the same locus ceruleus portion of the hypothalamus in which the MRA analysis showed that this is the actual response to stress on patients who are predisposed to this condition. So what happens in the, in the time chart, if we see the ECG and the ventricle dysfunction, that plasma levels in 0 to 1 minute, they suddenly catecholamines are elevated. There is ST elevation, e -E electrophysiological changes, and then cardiomyocytes get stunned. Central apoptosis may begin. In 10 minutes, blood pressure may respond to normal region depression begins, and beta AR G1 stimulus testing begins. And then in one hour, maybe the patient is hospitalized and then catecholamine elevated beyond those of MI patients in some, and coronary artery perfusion is normal in 12 hours, although regional dispersion continues. This is, there is induction of calcium handling genes leading into cardiac failure. In some cases, in one day, regional uh, depression may reverse, but epinephrine level, if we get, they will still remain elevated beyond MI levels. So they don't come down at, in, in, the, uh, in the way in acute MI patients. And T wave inversion with QTC prolongation may persist. In three days, regional depression macroscopically reverses, ejection fraction return to normal in three to seven days. So this is the time chart. 
So learning point from the pathophysiology is that there is cardiac, vascular, peripheral nerve, cognitive and CNS responses. There is temporal phase of the disease. In spontaneous cases, there may be different uh, subset. Females are 90%. In 90% of the studies, females are postmenopausal have been affected. And vasospasm and ischemia is the combination in these cases. So now coming to the treatment part. We have diagnosed a patient of stress cardiomyopathy. There is a pical ballooning, as Sir has shown in the videos. We have to decide upon two things. Patient is in cardiogenic shock. Patient is having low cardiac output. Whether patient is having LVOT outflow obstruction or not. If patient is having LVOT uh, outflow obstruction, we have to avoid anotropes. This may worsen LVOT obstruction further. We can relieve LVOT obstruction by giving titrated IV fluids beta adrenergic blockers, mostly esmolol or, 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 or metoprolol, and vasopressors, phenylephrine, if needed. If patient is having no LVOT obstruction, then we treat cardiogenic shock according to our uh, heart failure guidelines and shock guidelines. We can use inotropes like milrinone, dobutamine, dopamine, depending on the BP, and vasopressors can be added. If the patient has pulmonary congestion without low cardiac output, we treat as systolic heart failure, we can use vaso, uh, venodilators as well as arterial dilators and mild diuretics. Doppler echo is essential in all levels of treatment at the baseline and during the treatment part. During the first th three days, it is very important to see for development of LVOT obstruction, development of mitral irritation, increase of pH, or even thromboembolic risk can be identified if a large area of LV apical ache and is there. In very Less than 5% of the cases where biventricular dysfunction is there, the use of ECMO, Impella, or IEBP may be required for refractory cases of cardiogenic shock. Prognostically, stress cardiomyopathy has a mortality of 5%. Most in hospital death may occur due to unstable presentation, cardiogenic shock, cardiac arrest, or cardiac arrhythmias. Recovery is gradual, occurring over 1 to 2 weeks. Process may be rapid within 48 hours in some, or may be delayed up till 6 weeks as has been shown by the MRA studies. So does the heart recover fully following acute Takasubo? Abnormal myocardial edema has been documented, as Sir had also shown in his MRA cases, up till three months by T2, which shows that there is a specific pattern in some cases which persists. So this is the largest study by Templin et al. in 2015, which compared the patients of Takasubo with ACS patients. The majority of them required initial hospitalization Following discharge, although LV function remain, uh, came to normal, recurrence was around 5%. So, risk factor for long-term events were the same as in hospital, male physical trigger and LVEF less than 45% at discharge. Comparing the LVEF on admission, ACS patients, uh, the uh, 0 to 29% EF was found in Takasubo more than ACS patients. 30 to 44 was the commonest presentation in Takasubo. And on admission and recovery, almost 60-day follow-up, almost 290 patients, that is uh, almost one-fourth of the patient had recovered in 60-day follow-up. And uh, cardiogenic shock was almost similar. What distinguished between them was the, uh, the composite endpoint was also the same, while only the mortality was a little different in the ACS. So not a benign disease altogether, but this data has beautifully shown us and this is the kaplan mayer chart for mace events and stroke tia which says that the 30 day you know uh, 30 day uh, this uh, uh, mace events and death recurrence is very high in these patients remains higher than normal patients long term therapy beta blockers may reduce the risk of recurrence or even reduce the risk of arrhythmias ace inhibitors may be potentially cardioprotective but there is no study to prove these things uh, no evidence of use of prophylactic anticoagulation once a pical achanasia has recovered. So, in summary, Takasubo syndrome is increasing in incidence and more widely recognized in the medical community. The diagnosis can be challenging. Clinicians must look for signs, distinguish Takasubo syndrome from other causes of acute MI. The use of multimodality imaging is helpful in understanding the pathogenesis and pathophysiology. That's all. Thank you so much. So thank you very much, sir. So thank you so for the most of the lectures.
fall data uh, regarding the important one is uh, what is the use of uh, strain rate imaging in case of uh, tachycardia cardiomyopathy how it is going to be helpful in diagnosis as well as for the prognostic aspect uh, how much involvement is there we can assess by means of uh, strain rate imaging apart from the other modality of imaging in the form of uh, uh, 2d echocardiography 3d echocardiography as well as the uh, uh, how the BNP level is elevated is more significant when compared to the troponin in these cases, in this type of cases. And uh, what is the effect of uh, echocardiography in the form of diastolic function assessment, RV function involvement, and uh, uh, LVOT obstruction and acute MR in these cases? These are all the things, various things uh, the SAR has discussed elaborately. Likewise, Dr. Ramesh will going to discuss about the uh, uh, other uh, the second uh, lecture uh, and then we can conclude uh, if there is any more discussion any discussion by the participants thank you well, thank you sir as sir rightly said uh, echo especially strain imaging and 3d imaging was shown by uh, dr vinay sharma sir do you think there are any specific high risk uh, subgroups uh, who are more prone for in hospital death or uh, complications like say lvot obstruction, MR, low ejection fraction or involvement of the right ventricle. Are these features suggesting a high-risk group of the Takasubo syndrome, sir? You are asking me? Yeah, sir. You also. Oh, yes. Exactly. See, all these modalities, basically, they are defining the extent of the, uh, the, uh, the hemo, hemodynamic or structural problems. More extensive is the problem, more is likely to be the morbidity and mortality. But there is no direct, I mean, there is no study which can directly say that on a strain if this is the problem. Because the modalities which I have discussed is basically to establish a diagnosis. And then the morbidity and mortality uh, primarily depend on the diagnosis that this patient has got a target. So it depends a lot on the associated conditions also. Like we have discussed that these patients, although it's not necessary, but the third case which I have shown was actually a case which has an extensive quantity disease. And this patient has, a, has an stenting also. So although this time now he has got a Takatsubo, but the pre-existing associated conditions, they also affect. So basically it is a very complicated issue. The Takatsubo itself, you can say, when the patient has got, I mean, has got it, but the prognosis is not very, very good. And even in long term, even after recovery, they do not have a normal prognosis. Thank you, sir. This is to Dr. Rohit, sir. So you said about the follow-up uh, patients after, say, six weeks or 12 weeks. So do you recommend ECHO as a follow-up uh, imaging modality or you want to go for a, a CMR, say, to rule out edema or you said persistence of edema up to three months, sir? Myocardial uh -huh. edema. So do you recommend <laughs> echo, a simple ECHO or ECHO with a CMR for follow-up, say, after three months? I think I'll uh, recommend CMR as Dr. Vinay has also described. After, uh, if we go step by step, sir, CMR has a better myocardial tissue characterization, of course. We may miss some kind of myocardial edema, focal edema, then may put the patient to high risk. And uh, myocardial edema, if there is present, it is present, then we can titrate our doses of ACE inhibitors, beta blockers. We may not stop. We may not consider him as a benign patient. Echo will give you a normal LV, maybe. But MRI can help you further on for tissue characterization. So in that and case, this, you recommend and, a CMR over ECHO for a long-term follow-up. And months. this disease is, as the understanding is increasing, MRI will be included in the overall protocols. Although it's not recommended still because of few centers and the type of presentation. And uh, what I have found in ECHO, sir, the, initially, if we see that uh, LVDP is raised, these patients behave very bad. Their pulmonary congestion is more. And these patients are very small. Most of the DACA SUBO patients will have no not LVDP increase by simple pulse wave Doppler in MV. Their tall E waves will not be seen as compared to ACS patients. Their LVDP suddenly increases. Here there is myocardial stunning. The shape is such that there is no LVDP increase. These can be identified some subtle points which can identify in the acute condition. And in follow-up, MRI should overtake the role of echo. Rightly said, sir. So MRI should be the diagnostic modality of choice for follow-up patients with TTS, right? In fact, when I was preparing this seminar, you know, the message which I wanted to convey was that is a, this condition is a prime example of the old saying that your eyes will see what your mind knows. Unless your mind is primed, unless you are actually looking for it, you will miss out this condition. This is for sure. Because the clinical presentation is like that. 
That's definitely right. sir. In ever since in the diagnosis in 1990, there has been fourfold increase in the diagnosis of uh, acute cardiomyopathy. Not because the disease has increased. Again, 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 I will again I will say it is not an increase. The only thing is that we were missing it out earlier yeah, on. Exactly. We right. must have seen it exactly. many times and must have missed it also. Exactly. So sir. it is yeah. not the incident. So <laughs> in exactly. 2001, the uh, the presentations came in 2001. 1990 first diagnosis and 11 years it took to be uh, published yeah right for yeah. the identification of this disease right sir but then you have a nice discussion i had a nice discussion if there are no comments on the chat box or the questions on the chat box can we conclude sir yeah there are it no was questions. nice interacting with you right sir thank you sir thank you thank you so much thank you sir and thank you to all thank you very much sir Uh, thank thank you, you and good night to all. Good night.